What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where we talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Clint Thompson of DigiHype Media. And Clint, before I formally introduce you, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. Um, and this is part of the top agency series. There's some interesting ones to check out. Um, I actually had a D. Clevett. A D. Clevett helped. This is an interesting niche, Clint. Um, she helps companies. She's a done-for-you service to help them with their SOPs. So she comes in and helps create the SOPs to streamline onboarding of clients, of staff members, and she's an easy button for that. So and we geeked out on our favorite productivity tools and efficiency tools, which was a fun episode. So check that one out. Also, another one was Todd Tasky. Todd Tasky um, helps pair agency owners with private equity. So he helps sell agencies and he has a second bite podcast because he's found um, sometimes the agencies make more on the second bite than they do on the first when that private equity sells again. So it's super interesting conversation, again, about the agency space, about valuations, business in general. So check that one out. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. Uh, at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream relationships. And how do we do that? We actually do that by helping you run your podcast or an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the accountability, the strategy, and the full execution. You know, Clint, we call ourselves the magic elves that work in the background to make it look easy for the host so they could just create amazing content, create amazing relationships, and most importantly, run their business. Uh, so the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com to learn more. And I'm excited to introduce Clint Thompson. He's a founder of DigiHype Media, and they help companies with websites, design, branding, digital paid advertising, programmatic, um, and much more. And they've been around for, maybe by the time you're listening to this, over a decade. Um, so he's going to share his depth and breadth of experience. And uh, I'm excited to introduce Clint. So Clint, thanks for joining me. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. I, I, I'm really excited to be here. And uh, this is a thrill. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Talk about um, DigiHype Media a bit and, and what you do. And while he's talking, you'll see there is a video version if you're listening to the audio. Um, and I'm going to pull up their website, we'll poke around, but tell us about DigiHype Media. Yeah, for sure. Uh, DigiHype Media is, uh, and you're accurate, it's a 10 year old company, uh, was born out of the need for SMBs to assist SMBs with uh, digital marketing. Uh, digital marketing, as we know, has changed over the last 10 years, but certainly 10 years ago, the main focus and goal of DigiHype Media was to ensure that we demystify the marketplace. Uh, that being said, there was a lot of, uh, you know, intrigue about being involved in digital, but a lot of business owners weren't sure what to do, how to go about it, what aspects of digital were important, what were not. And of course, budget constraints would, would affect uh, how their results were. So our initial goal and still continues to be our goal today was to assist businesses in ensuring whatever they have to invest in their businesses invested appropriately and uh, that they find some level of success uh, to bring them closer to their ultimate goal of uh, you know having a, you know a solid ROI. And I know um, throughout the years you've helped a lot of different types of companies from associations to food service companies to e-commerce to luxury homes. Talk about maybe one of the first milestones of a customer when you first started the agency? Yeah, um, I think one of the one of the major milestones that we hit was uh, about four and a half, five years ago, we had a client and we'd always considered ourselves 
uh, a business that's a small business trying to help small businesses and, and other businesses. Uh, but we had uh, we had a, quite a great brand and quite a great name out in the industry, especially uh, more specifically in the GTA, the greater Toronto area and surrounding area. Uh, but we had a factoring company approach us uh, to talk to us about delivering, uh, you know, their brand name in the GTA, uh, more specifically uh, bringing them uh, better profitability and better reach and frequency in the GTA than they had currently been having. And the reality was, is that we embraced this. This was a real opportunity for us. Uh, you know, factory companies typically are mid to large companies. Uh, this particular one had been around for many, many years, branched out all the way across Canada. Uh, and we've been, you know, since then, we've been very, very excited working with them. And it's given us an opportunity to see how easily we can scale as a company and how easily a lot of the things that we use, a lot of the tools that we use for smaller and mid-sized businesses can also affect and assist large businesses to achieve their goals. So that's that was a big, uh, uh, a great moment for us. What were some of the things you did? And just explain for a second, for people who aren't familiar with what a factoring company does. Sure. Uh, a factoring company essentially assists uh, other businesses uh, that are having challenges collecting uh, on their uh, accounts receivable. And uh, their job is to, they can take on your accounts receivable and they can assist you with uh, collecting on your accounts receivable in a timely manner and making you, of course, be able to you know be more profitable and to be more timely on your bill payments and your growth and stuff like that. So, so thanks for that. It's really, it's valuable service, I'm sure, for businesses. What um what did, were some of the things you did for them? And I imagine like sometimes with client engagements, maybe they come to you with one thing and then things expand. Maybe they're like, oh, we need something with our website. Or we need something with branding. We, so where did it start with them? And then what happened from there? So you hit the nail on the head, Jeremy. So when, it, when we first sat down and chatted with them, it was about getting more traction for their brand in the greater Toronto area. That was a bit of a challenge, especially with a national company. Uh, typically, national companies, national advertisers will get the branding for the entire brand. But to be very specific and very you know, geocentric, it's very difficult for them to do. And of course, it's, it's, it can be uh, uh, very costly. So their big goal was to have their name uh, be identified in the greater Toronto area and surrounding area in Ontario. And uh, so our first, you know, initial meetings were all about, okay, what's this all about? Same questions you asked, what is factoring? Well, uh, we had no idea. We deal with a lot of different verticals, but certainly that one we've never dealt with. Uh, but again, some of the same basic ground rules work for many, many different types of business verticals. And we were able to determine what they needed. So it started off with a website. It started off with having their own uh, sort of foundation in the Ontario marketplace. We weren't able to do certain aspects of the advertising. We talked about social media. We talked about optimization. We talked about things like uh, doing AdWords services to assist and affect them from a content perspective on the big search engines, the big three, Google, Yahoo, and Bing. And we were able to come up with a marketing program that's been effective for them to help them grow their brand in this marketplace. At what point do you decide I'm going to start my own agency? Wow, well, yeah. Well, this this was uh I've been in the industry for a long time. Uh for about 20 years at that particular point in time, uh about 10 years ago, and I kind of sat down. I, I I was the recipient of the golden uh golden handshake uh because, you know, the company that I was with was a, a huge uh company in, in Canada, a huge Canadian company that was changing gears and they were sort of restructuring. And, you know, it was timely for me because I felt that, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, my goal has always been, I, I want to make sure that clients I deal with, large or small, it's irrelevant. I want to make sure that they understand what they're getting involved in. And my biggest, the biggest piece to the job that I do is to educate my clients on the realities of advertising. I don't want to mystify them. I, I'm not a magician. It's not about making, you know, pulling a rabbit out of a hat. 
the reality is I want to make sure they understand that, you know, you do A, you might get B. If you do A, B, C, D, you're going to get an awful lot more, right? So I want to make sure the clients uh, get that. And I was given that opportunity when I left my last employee. And uh, I sat down one day with my wife, uh, my lovely wife of 35 years now. Uh, I sat with her and I said, listen, I said, uh, I'm going to start a new agency. And she said, what? I said, I'm going to start a new agency. I said, I already got a small spot, uh, a location. I already uh, leased it. <laughs> Were you going to mention this to me at all? And I kind of laughed. And I said, yeah, I'm mentioning it to you now. <laughs> I, I have a lease. So it, the, the irony was is that the, the first client that ever called us, it was just myself. And I got a call at uh, would have been about 5.30 on a, on a weekday, like on a Thursday. And this gal called me from uh, a pharmaceutical training company. And uh, she says, listen, you know, we've been dealing with a large uh, advertising firm for many, many years. We want to change gears. We're not getting the results we want. We feel more of a boutique sort of a store would be more beneficial. People we can sit down and talk to. We want to be able to know who we're dealing with. I said, sure, come on in. So the, uh, uh, the day they came in, the evening they came in, they said they couldn't be there until about 7 o'clock. Now, again, I'm the only guy there. I just hired a web developer who hasn't even started yet. I have nobody in my office. And the controller, uh, very nice lady, came in with their VP. Again, very nice lady. They walked in. And I'm so old school. I'm sitting there going, geez, this is going to be a little awkward having two women in my office at 8 o'clock at night. So I, I called my wife up and I said, listen, I have these two gals coming in. Can you do me a favor? Just bring a laptop, come and sit in the corner, play on Google. I don't care what you do, you know, chat all night, but I need to have at least a, a, another person there. It's not for anything other than to make them feel comfortable. Right. And, uh, and she did. So we had this great discussion. We talked about a lot of things and they came on board as clients and they were with us for about nine years. Wow. The funny thing was after the meeting, the controller got up and she said to me, she goes, Clint, Honestly, that's your wife over there, isn't it? And I looked at her and I laughed. She goes, there's nobody working until 9 o'clock at night, okay? That's got to be your wife supporting you over there. She goes, you know what? I feel good about this. And they came on board. And they were a great client for a long, long, long time. Did a lot of great things. Went from an Ontario-based company to right across Canada. Had great success. And they continue today. So, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of how it started. And, uh, and we're here 10 years later. What made you decide to start your own as opposed to you had a you know story career for decades at that point? You could have, you know, gone to another company and been very successful. Why start your own at that point? Uh, for for a couple of reasons. One is the big challenge in the industry, as I mentioned before, was that many of the clients I dealt with as a senior manager, or a senior director with a number of the companies I worked for, the big challenge was having a human being that they could relate to, that they can call, that they can talk to, someone they can email and have a response from within a timely period of, uh, of time. That was a challenge. It, was, it seems very simple, but you know, with larger companies and companies that are publicly you know, supported and so on, you know, they, have, you know, they have a lot of servants, right? So the big, the, big, uh, the big plus for us was that we, you know, there are no levels to our organization. There's one level. We're here to serve the client. That's the start and that's the end of it. How we do will be determined based on the client's success and whether or not the client stays with us and grows with us. So the reality for us is that's the reality for me anyways, is that's how we got involved in this business. And that's how we decided the route we wanted to go. I could have gone with another corporation, had many, many suitors, you know, uh, call me. But at the end of the day, I felt that this is something and the timing is right, that clients needed this sort of support and this sort of one-on-one -on -one hand holding uh, respectfully to a system with getting, you know, getting to the digital marketplace. I want to talk about the evolution of services, right? You hang up your shingle, you have your office. I thought you were going to say you were going to give, you know, 
get people from the local co- local coffee shop and like you have 10 people set up in your office <laughs> your your wife yeah. i guess you know did the <laughs> did the trick for that um what was the evolution of your services? Because in the beginning, like you said, it was you and you hired a developer. So we'll talk about the evolution of the staff, but what were you offering from the beginning? How's that evolved to today? So having a lot of experience dealing with clients and dealing with some of their concerns and their challenges, I knew that First off, 10 years ago, the big challenge was just ensuring you have a web presence. And that started with a website. So my discussions, I was the guy, right? I mean, my discussions was with anyone who would hear me, I would talk to them. And a lot of my friends and business colleagues know that once I get involved in talking about marketing of any sort, I'm a very passionate guy when it comes to that. And I can talk about it all day. So if I happen to walk into a restaurant for a coffee, or walk into a restaurant in the evening for dinner, I'm going to talk to her off. I'm going to end up talking to the owner at some point in time in that discussion. So that's kind of how the business developed. It was really through people that I met, people I talked to. I, I sort of went about it very differently, Jeremy, because I didn't want to reach out to friends and family, which is kind of the first thing you learn in sort of sales 101 is, you know, you got to reach out to your friends, got to reach out to your family. Well, here's the reality with my personality. I'm the type of person, I guess it's kind of a Libra thing, but I'm the type of person that needs to prove the value before I move forward to entice anyone that I know uh, about what I have to offer. So it was all about proving the value prop for the business that we had. So starting from zero employees to one developer to going out and talking to people to building Uh, a services structure, which gave us the different types of products that we had, you know, from just web development, simple web development, one page, five page, 10 page, custom, whatever it might be. And we built everything at the beginning to learning about technology as we were doing it, because believe it or not, 10 years ago, web technology was changing dramatically, right? I mean, WordPress was not WordPress of today. Shopify was barely around. I mean, all these things were brand new. So we were playing with things that we knew nothing about, okay? Uh, But the reality is we try to, I always, you know, learn from my dad, try to keep things as simple as possible uh, for your own sanity. And of course, for the reality that, you know, if you can fix it, build it, service it, then your clients are going to be happy. So that's what it's always been about. And at the beginning is something, you know, kind of my mantra has always been, you know, and I always tell my staff, we can, we should, and we will. You know, I'm a very determined individual, but with that determination comes a lot of responsibility because, again, coming back to friends and family, I want to ensure that if anyone ever refers, and many have referred people to to our business, that we take care of them like family. And that's how we deal with every single customer. So it started as websites. At that point, you know, shockingly looking back, it may have not been like an easy sell even for someone. Like, what do I need a website for? Some people were thinking. But started with websites. And then what were the next services that you layered on yeah, after that? Sure. So uh, I started to talk to clients. I did a lot of research on social media at the time. And social media 10 years ago, of course, was very, very new. It was very, very much a communication tool for younger people. It was not necessarily proven at that point as being a business tool or a networking tool at, at, uh, of any type. And I mean Facebook, you know, any of those, LinkedIn, any of those different platforms. So I created some packages and some programs around those, you know, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. And I guess at the time it was Instagram. I just really sort of started up. So they're all fairly new. And when I went to clients, that's kind of the next layer after website was the natural move was social media. Uh, so we needed to we needed to determine we meaning I and whomever else uh, needed to determine the what and the how. So what would we produce that would be valuable to clients? And then if this is the case, whether it be you know curated content that we're taking off the web, which was again ten years newer. And uh, and or created content, how are we going to uh, publish it 
to make sure, A, we don't, you know, uh, upset anyone who may have been the original user of that or creator of that, and uh, make sure that there's value there for, for our client. So a lot of things had to be sort of sussed out. So the biggest challenge, websites actually wasn't the biggest challenge going out to talk to new clients. Social media was. It was a bit of a hoot, actually, because for me, it, it's more of a challenge than anything else. When I walk in and talk to a client about social media, they laugh at me and say, no, my kids play on that stuff. That's not for business people. That's not for real people. And by the way, say, Listen, Clint, it's funny to look back because the same patterns are today. Exactly the same patterns. A new social media comes up. Absolutely. No, nope, that's not for business. My kids are on it. And then slowly over time, businesses, absolutely, the early adopters tend, mm -hmm. tend to win. So it's the same pattern. Anyways, yeah, keep going. Absolutely. Well, yeah, no, it's 100%. It kind of goes through that cycle, right? So, uh, you know, early majority and, you know, the early adopters, early majority, it kind of goes through that cycle. But that's the reality is that it was, it was for... You know, people thought that they didn't need to be on that or they shouldn't be on that, and it was the wrong audience. The reality is the early adopters who did enough research to find out that, you know what, you know, maybe I'm a, you know, I'm a physiotherapist and my business, you know, deals with a lot of athletes. A lot of these athletes are young and younger now. You know, they're in their 20s and late teens. These are the people I want to get involved in my business. And all of a sudden, it started to take uh, take root and started to get some traction. So people would get on board and we'd show them, listen, here are some of the results from some of our current clients without getting into names and specifics and stuff. But here's the stuff you can expect. And this was, you know, this was not something that was very targeted back then at all, because this was just organic. This was not uh, advertising. It was just organic uh, social media for them. So that's kind of was the next step. Uh, beyond that, then we started to grow into things. Once we had, you know, new personnel, and we were able to grow into, you know, and, and educate ourselves as well into how to do things properly, and to sort of learn from the best, and to sort of take and say, okay, we can use this. No, we're not going to use that. That doesn't work well. Uh, then we started to build things like SEO and so on and, and so forth. What about so I could see that kind of evolution of the services from websites to social media, social media gets into content and also gets into paid advertising. Um, talk about staff. So you start it's you and your wife in the corner. And <laughs> that's right. And then you you bring on a developer. Mm -hmm. What was the evolution of the staff after that? Sure. So we, we brought on a developer and the developer was new and uh, really wasn't a developer. It was a fantastic person. Um, and he was learning while I was learning. Uh, as we started to grow and we needed, once we got in, say, a dozen or so new clients, of course, one developer can't handle that work. And I was also assisting with, I was basically doing the social media myself. Um, my son got involved my son who is our marketing director uh, and he got involved at an early stage and i guess the big win for me was that he was very technically inclined and he's just a voracious reader loves can't get enough information and really really dug his heels in and started to help us build out a platform that could work that we could scale to work for our businesses that come in and come on board. So whether it be a platform for web development, creating sort of blocks of documents that could be used uh, or using uh, certain uh, different types of uh, framings for different frameworks or different types of verticals of business, or whether it be using, utilizing, uh, creating social media content that can be used contextually in different areas, different verticals, uh, he sort of started building all that information. He was very, very instrumental in helping us grow. So that's kind of where it went. It kind of went from a developer to sort of a marketing guy uh, and uh, who grew into a developer, designer, you know, social media expert and sort of built it from there. And then what about after that? Well, after that, once we started to grow, we got to the point where we were probably somewhere north of 40 or 50 clients and then we were like struggling <laughs> like most businesses do when you start to develop uh, and we needed more personnel. So uh, what we started to do is we started to look for more developers and we got 
more developers and more social media people. We had a proper system in place where we could hire, train, and bring on board slowly uh, people that can assist us with uh, you know servicing clients on an ongoing basis. A lot of our business is a repetitive business uh, because we put them. We t- typically have our clients on a program that can help them grow strategically. And that, of course, is growth over time. It doesn't happen overnight, especially with you know online and digital and the search. So we grew to uh, four or five developers, social media people, uh, three or four or five social media people, and uh, you know even to uh, the point where we had a production manager who would manage everything and uh, ensure that uh, when we started to bring on board. Uh, larger clients uh, that we were doing all the contract work for, uh, she would be involved with ensuring that all the different pieces were in place. You know, new contracts would come in, they would go to, you know, the department that would break them apart, whether it be social media, whether it be web development, whether it be content, blogging, video, and she would break it apart very strategically to ensure. And then would we would manage that, she would manage it, that would oversee the whole operation. I'm wondering. So that's kind of where we've grown to. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I'm wondering. Um, you mentioned a system in place for onboarding clients and staff. What does a tech stack look like? Are you using different project management tools for this? Um, are you using digital platforms? What does your tech stack look like? So, having a marketing director that's very, very savvy, you know, in the online world. We use a number of different, uh, first of all, we have, we, we need to ensure that our communication tools are in place. So we use the typical ones like Slack and so on. Uh, but we also use tools like Monday.com. Uh, because we're sort of a one-stop sort of uh, sales uh, organization, we don't have multiple salespeople out in the field. Uh, we deal directly with uh, partners and we deal directly with, uh, I deal directly with clients myself. We tend to use uh, an in-house proprietary platform as well that sort of pulls those two other platforms together that we can manage. And we also use other workforce tools that assist us with uh, making sure that our stuff stays on schedule. I know um, before we hit record, we are talking about partnerships and how important partnerships are. Mm -hmm. Um, Just talk about um, how partnerships work into and play a role in, in DigiHype? Yeah, partnerships are uh, an essential part, I think, of uh, a boutique store like us, uh, simply because we don't have a, you know, we don't have a salaried or commissioned sales force out there, but we do want to provide uh, the services, not on mass, but to the general you know, the general SMB, small, medium businesses out there. We want to still be visible. We can do that strategically through a partnership. To use an example of one partnership uh, with a company that's uh, Canada-wide, in fact, North America-wide that we deal with, we can actually insert our programs and create uh, certain facilities specific to their clients' needs based on their uh, other advertising platforms that they have because they do have other things other than digital. Uh, so we can insert our products and their reps can ensure that that becomes part of their, you know, their strategy when they go forward. And uh, we've been very successful in building that. We even deal a lot with IT companies that partner with us uh, simply because, you know, people think that, you know, if I'm a programmer, I know digital. Well, yeah, you know, digital programmers are very, very intelligent people, very smart people. But at the end of the day, programmers aren't web developers. Programmers are not social media experts. Programmers don't uh, curate and create content. They don't blog. Many of them don't. So many of these things, content driven, are done through digital marketing. So we're able to partner with companies like that that have those needs and they run into them all the time. I mean, most IT companies, and we have many of them that we deal with, most of them can't and don't have the facility to do any of the social media, any of the web development, any of that sort of uh, work. So it's very, very easy for us to step in, have those conversations. And we have the conversations in the same boardroom as, again, a partner. So DJI Media is partnering with this IT development company. And we sit down and we speak to their customers' needs based on what they currently have, 
based on a budget that they may have talked to us about, or maybe there's something that we say, listen, you know, based on your budget, this is what we think you should step up to, or maybe you don't need to spend that much, which is something you don't hear too much in the advertising field. But, uh, you know, maybe you should look at doing this first and step to the next level, uh, you know, a year from now. So it's very easy for us to step into a partnership role and be that sort of professional source of advertising and branding information. And we've done many, many different jobs, some even just branding based. So, I mean, we've won many awards for you know, uh, and they, they call us an advertising agency. And I sort of, I smile because there's a very, very uh, different sort of feel when you say that someone is an advertising agency. Uh, you know, I always joke with my clients that we don't have a cappuccino machine, we have a drip coffee maker uh, in our office. And and I say that because, you know, we don't, I'm not saying that advertising companies are, but, you know, we're gen- we're not pretentious. I mean, we're essentially just, we're regular people running a small business and our main goal is to help you succeed, right? The old we can, we should, we will uh, sort of uh, motto. And, and it's kind of changed now. It's now anytime, anywhere to anyone, right? Because, uh, you know, now we're dealing with things like programmatic advertising and so on. And, you know, digital out of home advertising, which is sort of the next level that we're in, the next, next step we've taken in, in our evolution. So I know people can't handle partnerships differently with their partners. Um, and, uh, maybe some white label so they don't know and some they're just open about yes this is our preferred partner and the other side is um what have you found works and doesn't work when you're incentivizing partners to refer you because i know people have different programs where here's what we offer maybe they Mm -hmm. you know work out some type of compensation model um what have you found works and doesn't work when it comes to partnerships so for us typically uh there's there's two parts so two two answers to that question to two questions one is is that if we can't brand digital media we're not interested in partnership partnering so we're very very different that way we're not going to white label we're not a white label company we're we're a digital marketing advertising company so we want our brand out there the second part is we're going to make it very easy for you to a uh, be able to approach us for uh, your clients and with your clients, and we're going to do that because we're going to be able to offer up all our pricing specific to your client needs. So you can come to us and say, "Listen, here's the areas that we've had interest in, right? We know you offer this, you know, A, B, C, D. We have clients that want A, B, and C." Can you assist us with that? And we'll actually put together a service plan and a pricing plan specific for their company that they can either market up however they want, or they can get us involved and we can come to a, a you know an agreement that listen, realistically, don't go beyond this percentage because you're going to lose that client, right? Or let us approach the client on your behalf. Anything beyond this is going to be yours anyways. So it's kind of a very uh, easy way to deal with bigger companies. And for us, it's worked very, very well. We can be very uh, hands-off or we can be as hands-on as, as they want us to be. And uh, either way, our staff is very, very well versed in. So, you know, dealing with clients and being able to talk one-on-one. Customers, even partners love the fact that, you know, if someone needs to talk to one of our web developers, Alicia, they can literally call her up. They can send her an email and she'll respond. She knows the protocol. We've been doing it for years. And it's very easy for clients and they feel good. You know, they may not even have had that experience dealing with their current company, but we make them feel comfortable. But this is the right thing to do. And we are assisting your company to sort of get you to the end result. So partnerships tend to work very well for us if we sort of set them up that way. From a pricing perspective, it sounds like they could pass along that discount to their client or they may mark it up because they may do extra services or something alongside with what you're doing. Yeah. And they have the, yeah, we give them that flexibility, right? So, you know, we, we tend to suggest a certain amount of a markup if they want to don't go beyond this. From our experience, you're not going to get the results or the, the, the response you want from your client, which is to go ahead. Uh, so don't, you know, don't go, uh, you know, too far beyond these numbers, but, 
most of them will sort of stick to that number and they'll they'll get the results that they want and they'll get the client on board for that digital piece. And if they need help with it beyond that, again, we'll jump in, we'll sit in on the board meeting and say, listen, folks, here's the reason why, here's the value, here's the end result you can expect. This is why you need to do this. I want to talk about sales. Clint, you have a, if you look at your track record, okay, mm-hmm. you have a lot of experience in sales, a sales manager, director of sales throughout your career. So I'd love to know some lessons. And it's funny because if I just looked at your background, I'd be like, I guarantee you they have a like a, just a rock star, huge sales team because you have a lot of experience doing that. But it's actually the opposite. You have more partnerships. So it's interesting, but I but I'm sure you still employ those same concepts with you and your team when you're talking to clients. So I'd love to hear just some of the lessons uh, in sales that you've had um, over the past, you know, 20, 30 years. Yeah. I, yeah. And, and I, uh, we are different and unique in the, in the fact that we tend to work with partners as opposed to direct. Uh, we still do a lot of networking through the chambers and different things like that. That's kind of part of our business uh, uh, plan or program, but the reality is we we always and and I as a business owner tend to try to train and ensure our people are trained somewhat in selling, and that's kind of an internal thing, right? You know, I can sit there with a web developer and say, "Here's a six step selling process. It's going to go in one ear and come out the other. It means nothing to them." But at the end of the day, I want them to understand that the money that comes in the door feeds all of us. This is the growth that you will expect when you ask me for a raise or when you want the company to buy this or more equipment or better equipment or new equipment, whatever it might be. These are the things that keep us growing, right? Uh, as far as uh, as far as far us being able to – sorry, I, I missed the last part of the second part of your question. No, just the, like any lessons of sales that you've had. Yeah. like. You've led okay. big sales teams. I mean, you worked uh, the Yellow Pages, Call Genie, and and, mm-hmm. and more. So I just want to hear lessons you picked up along the way in in sales. So I, as a salesperson, I guess you know having a certain sales protocol when you go in to see a client. I've always maintained sort of in the back of my mind when I deal with a customer, but I generally. You know, and this comes with experience and it's not for everyone, but I generally tend to sell, but I don't sell, I educate, right? The realities are that, you know, the digital marketplace and the advertising marketplace is consumed with information. There's so much information out there. It's very confusing uh, for most business people to sort of go in there and figure out what's right, what's wrong, what they should stay away from, what they should, you know, stick to. So for me, it's all about education. And I, in a lot of, I'd say 99.9% of the time, when I sit with a client, I have to be properly prepared and I'm always properly prepared uh, with the information I need to know about them. I need to know about what they do. I need to understand and, and equip myself with what their competition does. All that sales strategy stuff is always in the back of my mind right? Introduction, you know, do all your prospecting, do your rapport building, all that stuff when I walk in. You know, I walk into a client's office and he's got, you know, uh, trophies all over the place and they're all about, you know, with cars and stuff. And first thing I'm going to ask him is, wow, you race cars? You know, so the sales process never leaves me. But what has changed and with anyone I work with, I always tell them, listen, this is not a strategy. This is, this is our livelihood. We need to ensure that we're educating our clients and what is current, what is right, and what will work. Those are the things we have to be able to do. And then we support that with value and results, with service and results. That's how we support it. If there's no results, and if the work that they're doing, uh, that we're doing, is not at the level it should be, a level of expectation, then we're not going to keep the business. It's as simple as that, right? But those are the things, that's what I typically use as an in and as a sort of a continuance to be able to work with clients long term is simply by educating and keeping them up to date and abreast of what's going on in the marketplace and where we should change gears as well. There are a lot of clients out there that have been with us for a long time that honestly 
you know, they'll sit back. They're happy to just keep spending what they're spending because they're seeing results. But, you know, from time to time, I'll call up and say, listen, you know what, John, I haven't heard from you in <laughs> five months. You know, I know you're reading our reports. I see you open them. But at the end of the day, we need to talk because there's a couple of things that you may want to look at uh, investing in, <clears throat> you know, digital out of home, programmatic advertising. These are all new things. I know you're expanding to Ottawa. You know, let's talk about that. What do you need there? So these conversations have to go on, uh, and these are all part of sort of what I do uh, with current clients. Is there enough hours in the day? Generally not, but you know, COVID, <laughs> but with you know, COVID has changed the landscape, as you know, uh, dramatically. So you know, people being virtual has actually helped in that regard to be able to talk to them. So, Clinton, you know, there's a difference between. Thanks for sharing that. Um, just, you know, stuff that's rumbling around, a lot of stuff that you forgot is more than what mm -hmm. some of us have learned. So I appreciate you just sharing some tidbits there. But no problem. from a sales perspective, it could be also a lot different from a sales manager perspective. And so if an agency is listening and they do have a sales team and they have sales managers, what's some advice that you have found has worked as this, because you've also worked as a sales manager for large companies. What's worked for you when you're managing mm -hmm. a sales team? So if, if I'm working with an organization that has their own internal sales team, the first thing I need to do is ensure that they're, again, educated on the service that we're providing. It's not about having it as an add-on. Many organizations give information to their salespeople and they send them out into the streets. This is worth $500 a month. This is worth $10,000. This is worth you know, five, 200 bucks. It's not about that. It's about finding out where the needs are. So a bit of it, a lot of it actually is training in the, in the, in the forefront before they even hit the streets with the, with the information. So we don't release any pricing. If we're partnering with someone, we ensure that the company does not release any pricing information at all to the salespeople until they're properly trained. And I'll do the training myself along with typically Bradley or maybe a web developer, one of our web developers will, will also get involved in the training. And it'll generally be about four to five days long, the training. Uh, where we'll sit down and sort of do a Zoom meeting like this and we'll talk about, you know, how you approach a client with this, how this becomes part of the portfolio that you're presenting, why it's part of the portfolio you're presenting, and how it's going to make a difference to your client's results at the end of the day. It's not about taking away from their spend, it's about enhancing their spend. So that's a big part of what we do is the training aspect of it uh, before they go out. And then once they're trained in that aspect of it, then we can, you know, shoot them all the prices and then they can sort of go away and determine how they approach their current client base and any new clients that they may have coming in the door. So. So I guess I take my statement back. You, you actually are a sales manager because you, you just have a fleet of people that are not staffed by you. It's partners. And your serious sales management um, experience goes into your partnerships who are doing the selling for you, really. Yeah, so it, it has to extend. Yeah, absolutely. So for me, it's all about ensuring everyone is on the same page and presenting the same message. So yes, it is very much uh, sharing that information and ensuring that everybody's presenting the same stuff. So yeah, always managing. You know, um, I have one last question. Clint, uh, before I ask it, I want to point people to check out DigiHype Media, D I G I H Y P E media.ca um, to learn more. Uh, my last question is just resources. Some of your favorite resources. Um, it could be books, it could be mentors that you've learned from, either personal or distant. What are some of your favorite resources that you've gone to? in business and marketing, because I know that's a topic you really geek out on. Yeah, uh, well, there's two. I mean, business is clearly a big part of it. Um, my uh, father was uh, very, very big into marketing and, of course, was a director of a Chicago-based company, George S. May, for many years. Um, and uh, so I, I followed in his footsteps. Uh, so I'm a big fan of Dale Carnegie. Uh, and I've read all his, his books. And, I'm trying uh, to get my have. girls to read How to Win Friends and Influence People. Influence um, People. They're nine and 12, but I'm like, this is one of my favorite foundational books of all time. So 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, and another piece of uh, that I loved was uh, another book I loved was uh, the Blue Vase. It's probably a hundred page book. It's a small book. Never heard of it. And it's about yeah, it's a, it's an old, very old book, but it's about a salesperson who wanted to be a salesperson who uh, kept knocking the door on this, knocking on the door of this uh, business, wanted to be their salesperson. And the guy sent him on a task. He said, if you could do this, uh, get this for me. You will, uh, I don't want to take away the story, but at the end of the day, he, he was given a task that was nearly impossible and he was able to pull it off. And this blue vase became uh, the sort of the pinnacle for success for many business organizations, including one that my father worked at, NCR, uh, for many, many years. And the blue vase was only given to the top, you know, 0.5%, like the best of the best ever. And my dad has one of those blue vases in his, uh, at his home. And so I've always been inspired by kind of the Dale Carnegie, Carnegie stories, the blue vase stories. But I'm also very, very inspired by uh, sporting stories and so on, because I'm an ex-cyclist. My son is a duathlete. Uh, you know, always been involved heavily in sports, and uh, you know the Dave, David Goggins is of the world and stuff like that. Their their stories are pretty amazing to read and to listen to. Uh, so yeah, so those things, you know, very much motivational uh, discussions around you know the human factor and sort of going from zero to hero, and uh, you know stories. Uh, you know, I listened to your P ninety X story, Tony Horton. Uh, yeah. and I, yeah, you know, Tony took that business from nothing, you know, and, you know, his beginnings were, you know, it's incredible that a human being could take things that far. So, good, you know, that's why he's as successful as he is, right? So, because he has the grit and determination to do it. So, these, you know, there's many, many different, um, I, I sort of have very eclectic taste. It's kind of all over the map. Uh, but anything is either motivational, marketing related, and even new technology uh, kind of inspires me, obviously, in the line of work that I'm in. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, the David Goggins Can't Hurt Me is, is a great, uh, fantastic yeah. book. And Clint, I just want to thank you. Everyone check out digihypemedia.ca and check out more episodes of the podcast. And we'll see everyone next time. Clint, thanks so much. Jeremy, thank you so much. Hey, all the best. Pleasure to talk to you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.